Hello, I'm Daniel Benjamin, and I am the president of the American Academy in Berlin, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this semester's first Airbus lecture entitled Virgin Galactic and the Making of a Modern Astronaut by Nicholas Schmidl. Uh, I'm, I'm really pleased that you could uh, join us for this event. I want to particularly ex express my gratitude to Airbus for supporting this event and for supporting the American Academy in Berlin as we work to facilitate transatlantic exchange uh, on a range of different policy issues as well as the arts and the humanities. Uh, I know uh, many of you are focused anew on space um, now that we, uh, are, we hope are, are getting control of our terrestrial problems. Um, the uh, NASA's Perseverance rover landed on Mars uh, just last month, um, hunting uh, for signs of life. And um, it will study how astronauts' uh, future Mars missions might produce uh, oxygen from uh, uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which could also be used for breathing and even rocket propellant. So it is a timely thing indeed that we have uh, today's lecture um, on uh, Virgin Galactic and its effort to uh, create uh, a space term, space tourism industry. Uh, Nick Schmidl um, will uh, uh, detail this uh, with insights from his forthcoming book, uh, which will be out very soon. And um, and so uh, it's an it's an extraordinary insight into a remarkable new development. So. Um, I uh, do not have the, uh, the prerogative of introducing uh, Nick, who I'm pleased to have known for some years through various journalist and journalistic endeavors, um, but I get to introduce the introducer. So um, tonight's uh, introducer introduction and, and uh, the moderation will be done by Christoph Zeidler. Christoph is science editor of the German weekly newspaper Der Spiegel. Um, which I think everyone is well familiar with uh, and which remains one of the most robust uh, news magazines uh, in the world. Um, Christoph uh, actually has, as he was just telling me, a background in international relations, um, but he had, has had a lifelong interest in science and uh, has wound up uh, being a, first a science reporter and a, and a science editor. Uh, for Der Spiegel. He is the author of several books uh, on such issues as uh, the fight for natural resources in the polar regions, uh, uh, resources uh, in Germany. Uh, they are unfortunately not available in English, but after, uh, after his uh, exposure tonight, I'm sure that that will change. I certainly hope so. Uh, and he has also uh, been the recipient of the Friedrich and Isabel Fogel Award uh, for young, uh, young Business Journalists. Just let me give you a quick um, sense of the roadmap for uh, this evening. Um, we will have uh, Nick speak for about 20 minutes, and then he will have um, uh, an exchange with uh, Christoph, and um, uh, then we will turn to your questions and answers. You can submit those questions at any time um, do not try to raise your hand because uh, no one can see you raise your hand. That, that feature is not activated on Zoom. Please put it in the uh, Q&A uh, column and um, I'm sure Christoph will do his very best uh, to get to as many of the questions as he possibly can. So um, with that, Christoph, I am going to now Turn it over to you to do uh, do the honors of the uh, of the introduction. Thank you again for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Daniel, for your warm words. Um, so, um, ladies and gentlemen, tonight I have the honor to introduce uh, Nicholas Schmidl to you. And um, let me first tell you a few things about this outstanding man. So, Nick has written for the New Yorker since 2012, and. That alone is more than most journalists, including myself, will probably ever achieve. But not only that, um, his first article for the magazine, Getting Bin Laden, was already a National Magazine Award finalist. Nick's work also appeared in the New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, Slate, The Washington Post, and many others. 
He's also a two-time Livingston Award finalist and a winner of a Kurt Schork Award, an award that honors, as they say, brave journalists who bring us news from dangerous places. So what does dangerous places mean in that case? You get an idea how far Nick is willing to go in his upcoming book. He tells us how he once studied Farsi in Iran, how he wandered around in Central Asia, and then in 2008, Nick and his wife were living in Pakistan. He was researching a story on the rise of a young and rather brutal generation of new Taliban leaders for the New York Times. That in itself seems rather dangerous. But also his take on the developments angered the Pakistani government so much that he and his wife were deported from the country. Nick wrote a book about his time there, to live or to perish forever. But this is not the book that he will talk about in tonight's online event. Joining us from London, Nick will instead present his upcoming book, Test Gods, that will be published beginning of May. In uh, tonight's Airbus lecture, Virgin Galactic and the Making of a Modern Astronaut, he will tell us about his experiences in another dangerous place, California's Mojave Desert. This time it was not so dangerous for him, but rather for the people he was writing about. Nick spent four years embedded with Virgin Galactic, a company that is doing no less than building, testing, and soon operating a private spaceship. He will tell us about his experience, and after his lecture, I will ask Nick a few questions. But since this is obviously not a two-man show, as uh, Daniel mentioned, uh, you will be able to do the same. You may uh, submit your question uh, through that uh, Q&A field I'm sure you have found um, in the Zoom application that you have been using uh, for months now, um, as many of us have. Uh, so uh, put in your questions there. Um, I will then try to read a selection. Um, of those submitted questions um, so that uh, you can find out firsthand what you want to know. Um, test pilots, engineers, and visionaries behind Virgin Galactic's campaign to build a space uh, tourism company, Nick has followed them all for his story about bravery and sacrifice, about the thin line between lunacy and genius, about the new space race, and most of all, about pursuing a dream in an otherwise cynical world. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Nicholas Schmidl. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Christoph. Uh, and Daniel, thanks for the introduction. Christoph, that's uh, uh, very kind of you. I appreciate it, and it means a lot. Um, I uh, would want to thank everyone for tuning in. Um, it's it's a treat, and uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd been talking with the Academy about about coming and spending some time while working on the book. And it, we've gone from researching the book to writing the book for, ver for as, it, as, the, the, uh, as the time has sort of been punted for various pandemic reasons. And now we're uh, gearing up to promote the book. So I appreciate uh, you all staying with me and your patience and uh, your interest in, in me and in this project, uh, and as well as to Airbus for making this happen. Um, indeed, I uh, have a new book coming out uh, in early May. And Test Guides is is a book that I, I, I was effectively embedded with Virgin Galactic for uh, four years. And so this is a book about, it's a book about the space race. Uh, and it's a book about one company in particular, Virgin Galactic. And, but it, it is also a deeply personal book. Um, so, you know, it took four years of reporting, another two years of writing. And so I wanted to talk for the next few minutes about what it was about this story that piqued my interest what it was about this story that held my interest and then where things are today, uh, which will I hopefully sort of launch us into a conversation with Christoph, who knows this industry uh, as well as anyone and can sort of talk about this world and talk about more industry specific things. Um, so the story sort of for me in many ways, it begins and the fulcrum of the story and the turning point of the story is Halloween uh, 2014. Uh, it's a turning point for, look, it's a personal turning point because of my, my, my involvement in the project, and it's, and it's a major turning point for Virgin Galactic. That morning on October 31st, 2014, uh, Virgin Galactic was scheduled to uh, fly their fourth rocket-powered uh, flight test. They um, should explain a little bit about their, their configuration because it's very different from the traditional vertical launch rocket, uh, sort of vertical uh, launch rocket systems that we're, we're accustomed to seeing. In the sense that Virgin Galactic 
Uh, they have a mothership that they call the White Knight Two, and then they have a spaceship uh, that that is a, sort of suspended under the belly of the mothership. The mothership uh, tows the spaceship up to about forty-five thousand feet, drops the spaceship uh, to two test pilots uh, in, in the cockpit, light the rocket motor, fly for a few seconds horizontally, and then enter this steep near vertical turn, and that is the the and 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 uh, light the rocket, burn the rocket for sixty seconds. And in that vertical turn, you know, going approximately three times the speed of sound, uh, break through the atmosphere and, and reach space. So that's the plan. Um, on this particular flight, they plan to burn the rocket motor for about 40 seconds and to go to about 140,000 feet uh, above sea level, which is still uh, a, a muddy sky. It's, it's getting very dark. It's, it's um, you know, Things are beginning to sort of want to uh, uh, to lift, but there's still there's still gravity and whatnot. So, flight takes off that morning, and uh, it does not go as well. Uh, it does not go as planned. Um, there, uh, about three seconds, four seconds into the launch, the ship comes apart. Uh, one of the pilots um, miraculously uh, survives, and the other pilot, another pilot, dies. So now Virgin Galactic has one dead test pilot and one wrecked spaceship. And so, you know, there were, this was, this was national and global news. And, uh, and I remember looking at it and sort of scratching my head because I knew that there were companies that were in the rocket business, but I didn't quite appreciate that there were test pilots strapping themselves into a hand-built rocket ship and flying supersonic test missions out in the middle of the desert in California. You know, it, it was, it was, it was like endlessly zany and fascinating. And, and I, I, I wanted, you know, I, I was curious. So there was also a, a photograph that I saw that morning of taken that had been taken uh, prior to a previous flight. And it showed um, four of their test pilots, four, four test pilots are so involved with the program walking out to the ship uh, in the pre-dawn light. I remember looking at that photograph. There was a very kind of right stuff esque element uh, to it, and I remember wondering, you know, who are these guys? Like, who who are these? You know, they're, they're, they were in you know olive drab uh, uh, flight suits, but they weren't military guys. And it's like, you know, who's who who are these guys that are flying these you know this, these these you know really kind of hobby shop spaceships? And so I asked. My editor at the New Yorker, if uh, if he had any interest and uh, in, in me pursuing this, and he said he said yes. He said, but if we could get, as he put it, real access. So I'll come back to the real access in a second. There were there were some 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 other obvious questions. Um, one of which was, did I know anything about space? <laughs> the answer was a resounding no. Uh, the second was, did I know anything about aviation? Not really. Not, not, not quite as, uh, the answer was not quite as emphatically no as did I know anything about space, um, but I didn't, you know, I didn't know the, 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 the science or the dynamics or flight dynamics or anything. But then, but then the question was, did I know anything about pilots? This was a bit of a different story because uh, I grew up around pilots. My father was a uh, Marine fighter pilot, <clears throat> a Top Gun graduate. Um, he had flown combat missions in Iraq uh, and in Bosnia, the first Iraq war and in Bosnia. And his last job in the Marine Corps was uh, a three-star general who was the deputy commandant overseeing all aviation. So I grew up around airplanes. I grew up around pilots. I grew up around conversations about expanding the envelope. And so going back to this photograph, you know, I wanted to understand more about these guys. And I felt uh, in a way that... Uh, I think journalists who cover, in, in a way that journalists, um, <laughs> whether justly or unjustly do, I felt like if there was someone who could tell this story about the guys in that photograph, that I was sort of uniquely suited to try to, to, to take that on. So um, I flew out to California shortly after that. Part of the reason I was out in California is that uh, I was coming off of a really trying long-term investigation about a, um, that, that, that involved a Saudi, a litigious Saudi billionaire um, who uh, had been accused of uh, a $20 billion bank fraud. And he was threatening to sue me and the magazine in sort of every jurisdiction around the world if we went ahead and published the story. 
So, so we, were, we were finishing that story. And as kind of a palate cleanser, my editor said, why don't you go out to Los Angeles and write a story about, why don't you sort of do an investigation of the gossip celebrity website, TMZ? And he said, you sort of do, you know, you give TMZ like a dose of its own medicine. So I thought, oh, okay, I can, you know, that'll, that'll be fun. So this is right around the time I, I, was, I, was, I was preparing to take that first trip around the time that this, this crash happened. And I said, okay, well, I'm already going to be in, in LA. I'll go up to Mojave and uh, drive up to Mojave and see if I can, you know, meet some of the folks that are involved with the program. So I went and met with the president, a guy named Mike Moses. And, and I told him what I wanted to do, that I wanted to spend an extended period of time. I wanted to get into the company as soon as possible in the aftermath of this, of this tragic event, while emotions were still raw, and I wanted to watch them. Um, I wanted to watch how they recovered from this horrible accident. And I wanted to watch them build a new spaceship. And I wanted to watch them get back to where they were that morning, effectively in the program. And, and, and so, you know, that had been the fourth powered flight, the fourth rocket powered flight. I wanted to stick with them until they conducted the fifth. And because one of the concerns that we had about taking on the project generally was that it not fall into a trap that many other Virgin Galactic pieces have fallen into, which is to be given some degree of, of access, uh, you know, kind of a light degree of access to the program. Uh, and then, and, and so, you know, you get a sense that you're kind of inside. You then you describe all the program, all the problems that the program has had, why there are so many years late. And then at the end, to feature a quote from Richard Branson about how now they are really close to making it happen. And, and so we needed, we wanted, there was no way that we could sort of take readers on this very, very long uh, narrative journey without giving them something to hold on to at the end. And so, so Mike Moses and I agreed that, that the, the, the fifth powered flight would be, that, would be that moment. So I went out there the first time and very quickly realized that the access they were willing to give me was 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 uniquely special. Um, I I was allowed just to sit in on meetings um, with a tape recorder. They the pilots I was allowed to go up with the pilot. The pilots have all you know. You can't sort of train in a spaceship. Uh, it's either it's just you just do it. <laughs> there's no there's no kind of going around the racetrack at 50 miles an hour before you step on the gas and go around the track at 200 miles an hour. So what they have to do is they have an acrobatic airplane that they fly to, um, to practice their building up their G tolerance. They go in the centrifuge and they get spun around. They, they have a glider that they fly because the, the vehicle makes a glided re-entry and lands on a runway. Um, and so I did all of these things with the pilots. I, I sat in on the engineering meetings. I, I went out and got beers with the guys after work. Um, I ended up making 15 trips to, to, to Mojave. I was, I was mistaken for an employee on, on several occasions. And, you know, I very quickly realized that there was, that the New Yorker was going to give me a tremendous amount of space uh, by, by sort of, you know, uh, uh, journalistic standards. But there was, the story was so much bigger than that already after just two or three trips, I realized. And what I, what I needed to do was to find a way to stitch this all together. You know, you can, you can have too much information. If you know, when documentary filmmakers are, are let, um, are, you know, working on a project and they're just rolling tape for days and weeks and months on end, you know, it's like, how do you sift through all that and find the thread? So I needed, I needed someone through whom I could tell this story. And, and that's when I met Mark Stuckey. Mark Stuckey is the lead test pilot at Virgin Galactic. And uh, he had had, and has had an incredibly illustrious aviation career um, and also had this incredibly fascinating personal story. Uh, he recalls watching John Glenn's um, uh, first orbital uh, flight and telling his father after watching that, he's a, uh, 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 Stucky is a five-year-old kid at the time and tells his father that it, that evening that that's what he wants to do when he grows. That's what he wants to be when he grows up. He wants to be John Glenn. And his dad, who is a Mennonite, is a physics professor at the local college, a Mennonite and a conscientious objector, says to him, impossible, right? No way that any son of his uh, could become an astronaut because all astronauts come from the military and no son of his is going to serve in the military. So can you imagine, like five years old, this is what I want to do. I want to be an astronaut. 
And your father says, no, no choice. So like all good sons, uh, Stucky ignored his dad. He signed up for the Marine Corps. Uh, he applied to NASA. He signed up for the Marine Corps. He went into the Marine Corps. He applied to NASA um, four times. And each time he advanced all the way to the final stage, but didn't ever quite make the final cut. And he was beginning to kind of lose hope when NASA said, look, we can't offer you an astronaut spot, but we can offer you a test pilot position. And so he accepted, he left the Marine Corps, he went into NASA, he flew for a few years uh, at the Dryden Flight Research Center out um, uh, near, uh, out at Edwards Air Force Base, um, which is, uh, you know, as he says, this is where test dreams come true. And, uh, you know, that's where Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier, et cetera. So he goes out there for a few years, he does that. He gets a bit bored and leaves uh, NASA, goes and flies for the airlines for a few years. He's furloughed after 9-11. Uh, at one point, he's selling mortgages. I mean, it's, it's, you know, just he's telling me this, and I'm thinking, my God, what a, what a life, right? And then at the time of the Iraq War, um, Stuckey was, was, uh, he was a reservist in the Air Force. He had gone and he had signed up for the reserves a few years earlier, and he was doing reserve duty, and he was given the opportunity to go to Iraq. Uh, so he went, and uh, everybody was really pleased with how he did, how, how you know, he did on, the, on deployment and was given an opportunity to go anywhere he wanted. And what he wanted to do was he wanted to go do top secret flight test uh, in Nevada at one of the one of the uh, black sites there. So he goes and does that for a few years and he leaves the Air Force finally in 2009 and he's offered uh, a job, he accepts a job at Scale Composites, which, it, which is a, um, a, a sort of niche prototype Gucci little um, experimental flight test organization that um, it, it's sort of calling card is that it has developed a new airplane. It has, it has flight tested and proven a new airplane every year of its, of its existence. And uh, so Stucky, so and they also uh, had been contracted by Virgin Galactic to build and flight test spaceship Two, Virgin Galactic spaceship. So Stucky goes out there. Um, he is with the program. He flies the first three flight tests, the, fir the first three rocket tests successfully. Um, he does not fly the fourth. That's the one that he watches from the ground that kills his best friend. So I show up shortly after that and, and I think to myself, okay, this is, this is the guy. This is, this, is, this is through whom I can tell this story. Not only does he have this accomplished professional life, but he also has a tortured personal life that he's willing to share and talk about. He's willing to talk about um, a very painful divorce. He's willing to talk about his children at one point uh, being estranged from his children. And, and I'm, you know, and it's like, how does, you know, and my immediate thought is how do you compartmentalize all of this? And he, he, he let me into his life. He and his, and his, and his wife, um, new wife, they let me into their home. They let me into their life. Um, the relationship deepened and developed and he sort of very quickly became more, the relationship very quickly sort of transcended traditional source subject boundaries uh, in the sense that he became, he became a friend. I became sort of invested in his, in his, in his success and, 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 watch, and witnessing him try to accomplish this dream. And so, so that's what sort of held my interest. It was someone that was willing to, to let me kind of inhabit their inner life. And, and, and the other, the, the reason why it held my interest was not just this one individual, but that it was a way for me to write about my father, sort of without writing about my father. Because for all of the awe and respect and admiration that I have for my dad, he was always, uh, there was always a distance there. And, 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 and Stucky's son would say the same thing about Stucky at the time of the divorce, that, that his dad was physically absent, emotionally, physically absent oftentimes, and emotionally absent when he was home. It was, there's something about this sort of, you know, this intensity and this, this focus and this intensity um, that uh, it made me wonder, the more that I spent time listening to Stucky talk about it and then reflecting on my dad, it sort of made me wonder uh, about fatherhood generally and about whether the qualities of, of kind of, being a source of inspiration and being um, a source of, of a sort of being both kind of friend and inspiration are mutually exclusive, if that makes sense. And, you know, um, 
it it was you know that 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 father figure who's sort of oftentimes aloof and elusive um is often the 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 the, the father figure that we are constantly striving to emulate and so so that brought that line of inquiry back on myself because it made me wonder kind of okay well i'm around for my kids but am i am i, am I inspiring them like what am i doing what am i doing to make them think uh that there are sort of no boundaries and so it, it you know so that so so again it using you know the book was the book the book is an adventure story about stucky's attempt to sort of realize this dream but it became much more than that and so, so thematically, that's what sort of was holding my interest. And then narratively, what was holding my interest was, was waiting to see if Stucky was going to fulfill this dream. And so in, and in December of 2018, he did just that. Um, he piloted Virgin Galactic's first successful space mission. They reached space, this massive uh, achievement for the company and for him as an individual. And again, he let me share that moment with him that evening. Um, after the flight, I went uh, to his house with, with, with him and his wife, Cheryl, and uh, Stucky said, uh, he said, I have this bottle of whiskey that I've been saving for a really important night, uh, you know, for a special evening, and, you know, this certainly counts. So he goes and he gets this bottle of whiskey that Cheryl had gotten for him at some point, and, and I said, look, you know, I'm not, I don't know if you're, <laughs> I don't know, I'm not a whiskey aficionado. I've got a, you know, I've got a, a lead palate. I'm not sure you want to share your expensive whiskey with me. And, and he said, no, 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 no. Well, uh, he said, so do you want yours on the rocks or you want a, a shot of it? And I said, what, you know, whatever, whatever you want. And so he takes out two shot glasses. He pours the glasses. He pours us both a glass. Now, uh, I didn't, I haven't drank whiskey and I didn't drink, I didn't drink whiskey in 10 years, maybe longer than that. I mean, I sort of think that like, if you pour it in a shot glass, you're going to shoot it. So we put the cups down, we clink, I drink it back. And he looks at me like I'm sort of crazy and explains that no that's not what he meant he meant just that we would sip it and the next morning i proceeded to look that bottle up and it was like a 550 and dollar bottle of whiskey so i <laughs> wrote to him the next morning and i said please don't think that i'm some sort of uncouth bumpkin for doing that and so uh but that was that was the you know that that was the relationship is kind of and that that was that and that's in some ways the kind of the heart of the story so um where are they now the my kind of third point after that flight in December of 2018, they, they did it again. Um, uh, Virgin Galactic reached space again in February of 2019. And it looked very much at that point, after two months and just over, after two flights in just over two months, that they were on the cusp of doing what they had come to do, that they were going, you know, that they were on the verge of, of conducting regular suborbital space missions. Um, lo and behold, that has not happened. They've not gone to space since then, which is, uh, as much as Stucky, was kind of a gift from the journalistic gods in the way of giving me this 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 character this this person to write about. Um, nothing much has happened with Virgin's program since I stopped reporting, uh, which has also been um, you know which has allowed the book to remain and to be very sort of fresh and current because it's it's essentially it's there not much like I said there's there the ep if there, if I was going to write another epilogue right now it would be a few paragraphs and not a few chapters so. Um, what so they they have been hobbled by technical challenges and engineering problems, uh, but they still went public um, with one of these SPACs that everyone is talking about, funded by one of these SPACs, um, which is a kind of an investment vehicle that allows companies without a proven track record to go public. And so then they are now flush with cash. At one point, in uh, shortly before they went public, they had eighty five million dollars um, in cash. And they were burning through about seventeen million dollars a month. So there was not a lot. I mean, the 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 president of the company Moses said to me at one point, "By the time your book comes out, we'll either have made it or we won't." They now are spending twenty three million dollars a month, but because of this, uh, because they've gone public, they have six hundred and sixty six million dollars in cash. So they have there is the, the runway go the runway runs out. So um, the. It's not to say, however, it's not to say that it, that they're done by any means. They they, uh, and it certainly is not to say that the industry is done, um, because they're not the only player in the game. Clearly, SpaceX is is you know a world beater at this point, doing remarkable things, and uh, planning to launch their own space tourism mission uh, at the end of the year. Um, you know, I think that I think that Virgin's biggest challenge is that the hype is not sort of you know the hype has been their own worst enemy, and so that in some ways is what this book is about. It's about this, it's about this culture of this crazy town 
of these test pilots and engineers um, that are trying to fulfill this dream on behalf of this uh, eccentric, crazy billionaire living on a tropical island in the Caribbean, you know, telling the press often, you know, he's, he's gone quiet, Branson's gone quiet in recent months, but what, you know, had a, had a tendency to tell the press any, whenever given the opportunity that, you know, it'll be six months, we'll be in space, you know, a year before I'm in space, blah, blah, blah. So, um, and, and so the book is kind of how these two cultures, one of the, one of the themes is how these two cultures coexist. And so what I, what I have hoped to do, uh, and what, um, yeah, I mean, what I, what I hope to do is to tell that story of, of the guys in Mojave in a way that feels real, um, in a way that is sort of grainy and, and granular and is this gritty portrayal of life and death and tragedy and triumph inside of an experimental rocket ship company. And so that's how the book came together. Uh, I hope you read it. I hope you like it. And I uh, look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you, Nick, for the insights in both the professional and the personal aspects uh, of that of that project. And uh, I would uh, la, I would now like to take the opportunity to ask you um, uh, uh, a few questions. Uh, first of all, um, you mentioned that you never wrote about space before. So why Virgin Galactic? Early in your book, um, you also list the competitors. Why didn't you turn to SpaceX, for example, a company that indeed revolutionized the way that we think about space, led by a man that wants to build colonies on Mars. I mean, on Mars, for God's sake, or to, to, to Blue Origin, a company that has a very low profile, but pursues uh, the, the highly interesting project to build a rocket almost as big as NASA's original moon rocket Saturn V. And I mean, talking about the moon, both SpaceX and Blue Origin want to fly to the moon. Virgin Galactic merely reaches uh, the edge of space and still you deem them more interesting. Why is that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think that the reason why the reason why I gravitated towards Virgin Galactic was was really sort of, I mean, was it was that because this cra the crash was an instant as, as far as narrative magazine reporting goes, the crash was uh, an episode which I knew that I could write about. And I knew that I could sort of get into the industry um, and into the company through the lens of this crash. Now, there were a bunch of other factors that contributed to it. So, so and, and what that meant is that there was a human element to it. There was, there were, there were, there were, they had skin in the game, right? The other companies, while they ultimately will be putting people on rockets, they weren't yet. So what they were doing was speculative, speculative. and, and just the grandiosity of their ambitions was impressive. But for me, there was something, there was something, almost, I, I don't use sterile in a way, I don't want to use sterile in a way that's pejorative, but what Virgin Galactic was doing, and I, and I, I, I mean, I want you to think about Spaceship Two as effectively a Piper Cub with a rocket launch, or with a rocket motor in the back. I mean, this is a really um, basic, vehicle uh it is it is there there is a little bit of automation that has been introduced um uh, that is being introduced to the design now but up until then uh it was all it was it was a tactile flight experience so that in and of itself really appealed to me that that this was these these vehicles were flown they were not they were not engineers that were designing algorithms that you were pushing about and this was this was the company's success uh rose and fall on the quality and the on uh, the quality of their test pilots. So that was that was an interesting lens. The other thing is that there was there was a. I mean, I got lucky. I got lucky because they let me in, and I also got lucky because they at the time they had a um, uh, uh, communication. Uh, the woman who was running communications, I told her, I said, what I want to do is I want to do. I essentially want to embed with the company to write Friday Night Lights for the space industry. I want to sort of spend a season with the company and I want there to be this, this sort of linear timeline. And so it'll be kind of, you know, I said it's, it's the, the structure of Friday Night Lights uh, that sort of meets the subject matter of the right stuff. And she, um, you know, fortunately that was one of her favorite books and we were sort of off and running. So there was, a, so, and she is the one that, that, you know, her name is Christine Choi. She did this amazing job of, of getting me in the door. And once I was in the door, um, when, once, you, once, once a company lets you inside, um, if uh, you, I would like to think that if, if, if a journalist is sort of worth his or her salt, once a company has let you inside, 
it is now your job to make sure that they never want you to leave. And, and so, you know, I made friendships and I just uh, did everything I could to, to stick around as long as possible. You were embedded with the company for four years. You mentioned the 15 trips already. Um, and um, even for the most acclaimed journalist with the highest professional standards, that must be quite challenging. All the friendships you mentioned, for example, um, hashtag journalistic independence. How did you manage not to, to fraternize? How did you manage to remain objective in such a setting? Yeah, uh, it's a great question because undoubtedly um, I was frat. I mean, I was frat. I mean, I was, I was going out for beers with them. I was, you know, the, they, I reminded them that. So what I, what I always did, I um, take notes with, with a live scribe pen, which is a, a pen that writes on special dimpled paper uh, that captures audio as it's writing. So I could, um, I could be, you know, it's essentially a voice recorder combined with a pen and it has this little blinking light on the end. And, um, you know, I, in some ways, I the blinking light was the reminder that I'm listening to you. We're sitting at the bar together. We're drinking beer or we're in, in the, in, in the, in the uh, hangar, but I'm still a journalist and the, and the blinking light is the reminder that I'm ultimately here to tell this story. Um, and, but you're right, because what happens is that when you develop those personal relationships um there are things that uh there are there there were there are very 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 few things but there are things that um you know, people will make requests uh that and there was one request that someone said you know look this is this is really this is a difficult thing that i'm going to ask you know if it, it, it can you know it's a difficult thing that i'm going to ask do you need to put that in there and i I spent months sort of deliberating about this. And I said, you know, I was reluctant. I said, because if I open up the if I open up the floodgates now, then then who knows? And and you know, I said, look, because it doesn't impact uh, anything about the program, I can I can live with it. Um, but I, I you know, I just tried to consistently make make clear that I was there uh, in a role as a chronicle uh, to chronicle what they were doing, um, and I wanted them to like me, and I liked many of them, so, and I wanted them to like me because I wanted them to talk to me. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I felt like it was important to constantly be reminding them that, that, you know, I'm going to write a piece about this. I'm going to write a book about this when this is all over. And so, you know, that, that's, that's, that's how I kind of, that's how I feel like I, I threaded that needle. Uh, let, let's talk about that aspect uh, one more time. In the in the book, you mention how people close uh, to Richard Branson usually tend to keep reporters in a very short leash. And then you write, and then I went to Mojave to see how long that leash could get. So um, I asked myself, did you ever feel that leash during your time in the company? Yeah. Um, yes, towards the very end. And fortunately, by that point, um, so as I mentioned, at the company, there are these, there are, there are multiple cultures at the company and there is the culture at the company that is um, trying to sell tickets to uh, wealthy individuals. And that is marketing, um, that, is, that is selling Virgin Galactic, the brand and selling the experience and uh, does not like the notion of, essentially doesn't like you know, write it, stories written about guys with greasy hands, <laughs> and and they their version of the story, the, their version of the story that they want Virgin Galactic to be telling is one of uh, celebrity and glitz and glamour, and um, you know that this is this is the next um, sort of exclusive uh, travel opportunity for the rich and famous, and so um, the in in April of two thousand and eighteen, which was the uh, the big fifth powered flight that I was there, that I was, that was the bookend, right? That I was there to write about. And that morning I went to, uh, I was in all of the pre-flight briefings as usual, sitting, you know, leaning against the wall and uh, that, and then the flight goes up. And it, when the flight went up, they had had some lateral instability issues. They, the flip, essentially the, the ship had, had flipped on its way up. And uh, there was some concern both about how close they were to losing the ship. Um, and Stucky, uh, you know, kind of miraculously held on to, to held on and prevented the ship from, from starting to spin. And um, 
so afterwards I was going uh, to the ready to the room to the briefing room afterwards to, to hear what they were going to talk about and this individual who is the um, I don't know what his current title is now his name is Stephen Attenborough he is the uh, he is the kind of he is he, he is the one who's kind of selling the experience and he blocked my way in the door and wouldn't let me in and that was the uh, that, that's the point that I knew that the terms of the embed uh, were being renegotiated without my participation. <laughs> and um, by that point, I had uh, enough material to write what I needed to write in terms of the firsthand things. And I had enough relationships um, throughout the company to continue reporting and, 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 and continue the reporting um, through parsimonious, uh, through contemporaneous notes, through accounts, uh, through through you know documents and emails, et cetera, to be able to kind of piece the picture together for the next. And that was in April of 2018, and by February of 2019, which was the second space flight, I was effectively done reporting. So that's that that's that was the uh, that was the one that that was the time that I uh, like I said that I realized that um, the the honeymoon was over. Um, now let's talk for a second about the. the personal angle of your story. Um, in the book, you focus a lot of your attention on Mark Saki, the test pilot. And uh, you already mentioned uh, how uh, he opened up to you, how he uh, led you into his home and whatever. Uh, being a journalist and out of sheer professional curiosity, how did you manage to get this man to indeed trust you and to open up to you? Because as I picture test pilots, they're not like the, the chatty guys waiting for, for some random journalist to come around, even if he's a very famous and acclaimed one, uh, to just uh, talk about their, their, their job and their 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 personal life yeah so i had i had i think i had two things going for me uh from the get-go <clears throat> one of which was a um known institutional affiliation with being the new yorker and one and the second of which was a uh unique last name and stucky um uh, 35 years before i began reporting before I first met Stuckey, my dad had been Mark Stuckey's flight instructor uh, when they were both young Marines in Yuma, Arizona. And so um, <clears throat> Stuckey knew Schmidtel was the last name. Uh, I think, you know, I think that he probably thought it's quite likely. And so the first time we met, he said, uh, you know, you remind me of somebody. And we started talking and he said, yeah, you know, I, I know your dad from, from way, way, way back when. So, so that kind of got that, 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 allowed a um an initial kind of toehold if, if you will and and so we met a few times informally and what i think that he he later admitted to me he said um he asked me why i thought he cooperated so extensively for for the for the for the magazine piece and for the book and i said that um i genuinely felt like he felt like he had lived uh a pretty incredible life and that he was just sort of waiting for the right person to to tell it and uh and and you know look it it, it sounds sort of cheesy and faded but like you know we just it, we kind of met one another right at the right time and um uh both of us i think i think both of us went into it thinking that the other was going to give us something w one degree or level of of um that I was going to be able to be the person to tell his story. And he was going to be able to be the person to sort of let me tell the story. And I will speak for myself and, and, and uh, to say that the relationship was so much richer, ended up being so much richer than that and sort of uh, uh, exceeded, you know, exceeded my expectations and, and, and anything that I could have um, imagined. So uh, yeah, I mean, it's a great question and one we'd have to, we'd have to ask him at some point, but um, but that that's at least what he told me. That's an interesting triangle, I find. Um, Stucky, your father, and yourself. And um, uh, you you introduce your father rather late um, in the in the story of your book. Uh, did you know you wanted to do that from the beginning? I mean, bring in your father into the story. No, uh, I didn't, and and I think that I I. Probably, I mean, there was, I think that in the magazine piece, there might have been a parenthetical that said my dad's a pilot or something. It was really, it was really quick. Um, 
and and I think and I think that sort of reflected where I where my mindset was at the time, which you know when the magazine piece came out was August of 2018, which was almost four years after uh, I'd, I'd begun reporting, um, and and but the more that I thought about what brought me what what was driving my my interest, you know what what was holding my interest, as I explained earlier, the more I realized that um, it was it was the opportunity to reflect on, on my relationship with my dad and my relationship with my kids. And, um, and so then it became a question of when to introduce that. And um, what I was worried is that if I introduced it too early in the book, I wanted to, you know, there's this, there's this concern with, with books or with long magazine pieces or, you know, with movies, et cetera, that you get what's, what's called the saggy middle, right? You know, everybody can, you, everybody can write a, a sparkling opening and anybody can write a sort of flashbang ending but it's the middle part that oftentimes is when people start, you know, put books aside. And so I wanted to introduce some, some, you know, I, I've written a, a lot of crime stories and, and, you know, you're looking for that sort of that twist or that unexpected um, zig or zag in the middle of the story. And for me, it was it to introduce my dad midway through the story when all of a sudden I wanted re a reader to sort of sit up and think, oh, that's not where I saw this going. And, um, and so that was why I decided to introduce it then, and 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 you know, and, and by that point, I had made up my mind that I wanted to to, to bring that personal element into the story as well. Um, at this point, uh, I would like to uh, open up uh, a little talk to the questions from the audience, because uh, actually the first question that I got uh, in the uh, Q and A field was uh, somebody asking. I think that's uh, a valid yet very personal question. Why did you write a book about your father in the first place? Yeah. Um, because there were a few issues, one of which was even, even, introdu even introducing um, and telling the story about my dad the way that I did, I, was, I, was, I needed to figure out why I wanted to do it. I knew, I knew that I wanted to do it. I knew that, you know, so my dad, just to give a little bit more context, um, you know, so besides being a, a, a fighter pilot and a Marine general, um, he has a PhD in philosophy and, and lex lectures uh, at the Sorbonne uh, on Wittgenstein and races motorcycles. And it was just one of those things where like, he's an incredible man. And I wanted to, I wanted to tell, I, I wanted to kind of brag, if you will, right? But I didn't know, but I needed to figure out why I wanted, why I wanted to include that. And, and cause I didn't want it to feel gratuitous and so that's what I think took me a while was to figure out what was the, how had, how had his, how had my relationship with him influenced why I came to this book? And, um, and, and I, and, and the reason why I didn't and haven't written more about him is because frankly, he didn't, he, he, he's not as willing and, and still to this day is just, you know, it's just who he is. He is not as willing to let me into his inner life as Stucky. I mean, he, he doesn't, I remember we talked about, there's a scene in the book in which I describe, um, he describes for me uh, um, conducting the first aerial bombing raid uh, of the Bosnian war uh, by, by US, uh, by Marine Corps warplanes in 1995 and, and destroying this, this Serbian tank. Um, and and it's a it's an incredible story where you know he's flying two three four hundred feet off the ground sort of through canyons below the clouds and it's you know it's his wingman has left him and he's all by himself down below the cloud cover and it's you know he's he's flying back and forth trying to find this tank in his village and uh, running out of gas and he's dropped all of his bombs and he's down to just being able to use his machine gun and and uh, you know and he's like my age as he's doing this and I'm thinking to myself good God like what did I do today I, I like went outside and you know trim to the hydrangeas <laughs> so um so but i remember talking to him about it and asking him how he felt after they had finally had for he finally destroyed the tank on his way on his way back to italy to the base and i said you know what how did he feel were you you know celebratory or joyous and he said no i just kind of felt like it was uh you know another that that's what i was that's what i was there to do that was my job and so so when, I, so when I met Stucky and I would ask him that same kind of question and he was more willing to kind of engage at length with how he felt and what he was thinking, um, you know, you, 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 you sort of play the, heart, the, 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 the hand you're dealt and, um, 
it, uh, I just didn't think, I didn't think that there, I didn't see the kind of um, narrative opportunity to be able to write that extended version about my dad. Just an instant reaction from the audience. Uh, one of the participants says, boy, your father's story is unbelievable. So born fighter pilot, on and on. And then he says, no one's father ever lets his son or daughter into their lives completely. That's not their role. You have a real story to tell. And uh, I had the same idea when you uh, uh, told us about how you drank whiskey with uh, Mark Stuckey, because he drank the whiskey with you, not with his son that you also mentioned in the, in the book and how their relationship evolved. So Maybe there's also a lot, a lot of things to learn about uh, uh, parents and, and children here. Uh, but uh, let's let's try to widen the focus again for a second. Uh, let's talk about space. Let's talk about the industry. Um, and in another question from the audience, um, what is the connection to space? Virgin Galactic, um, as uh, the participant uh, puts it, plans to provide a 15-minute view from 100 kilometer altitude to the super rich. No other benefit for anybody. We can talk about that later as well. Um, uh, so maybe just a zero gravity flight might be an alternative. So what is the connection to space here? Yeah, I mean, this is one of the things that that when I started writing the, writing the book, I, I needed to kind of reconcile with myself and, and, and also with uh, you, my editor. I said, you know, this is a book about space, but very little of it actually happens in space. I mean, most of the action is it's a book about people sort of, you know, looking up at space, um, using space, you know, space being kind of a metaphor for, for expanding the envelope and, 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 you know, exploration, et cetera, but very little of it taking place in space. So the question about for what, in the case of Virgin Galactic, is, um, is a really valid one. Uh, I think that there are, there are two answers. There is, there's Richard Branson's version of the answer. There is Mark Stuckey's version of the answer. And then there's kind of a combination. Um, and I think I probably fall in the combination. Richard Branson's version and, and the, the, what he claims to sort of be the impetus is uh, this notion of the overview effect. So the overview effect is this um, phenomenon that astronauts uh, talk about when you know looking down on the Earth and having this um, having this kind of this 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 feeling wash over you that we are all exactly <laughs> that we are all uh, you know you can't see the difference between you can't see see national boundaries you can't see the difference between religions etc. and um, and sort of you know coming back with a restored sense of hope and unity and belief in, in, in humanity. So that's the kind of, you know, that's the highfalutin democratized space for the better of good, the kind of Richard Branson version of it. You know, Mark Stuckey, for Mark Stuckey, I think it was, uh, it was a challenge. It was an opportunity to explore. It was an opportunity to explore. And, and, and as he and I think other explorers would convincingly argue Exploration for the sake of exploration is, uh, has great value in and of itself. And whether um, there are, you know, there, whether there are sort of uh, uh, scientific or, or, or whether there are scientific gains to be made, there is the potential that if they can master this sort of suborbital technology, that it will give rise, that it will sort of, you know, spawn a, uh, an industry of, you um, uh, 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 hypersonic travel, uh, commercial hypersonic travel, uh, point to point travel, you know, to be able to fly, as they say, you know, to, to fly from Sydney to New York in a matter of two or three hours instead of whatever it takes, because you can get up and then you can get down, you know, you can kind of use a, a rocket propulsion to get up out of the atmosphere and get down in a quick, in, in a short amount of time. So, um, but I think, you know, I actually don't have the same, I, I see the questioner's point about sort of what for. But for me, I don't think that takes away by any means what that, that's a question sort of like for the business model. And for me, it was much more of um, the story was always about can they do it from kind of an engineering and flight test perspective? Can they can they set out to, to, to reach this suborbital thing? And I should say that even though suborbital is um, is not as as uh, far as not as high as orbital, it actually it is, it, is, it is a road less traveled. And therefore, because there's less data, um, it's not, it, it, is, it is no, I mean, I'm sure that there are, 
sure that there are engineers waiting to butcher me for saying this, but like there, it, it could, one could argue that it is every bit as hard as getting to orbital space because you have no guidebook to use. The X-15 was the last vehicle that sort of was, that suborbital space was its, um, was its goal. And, you know, the X-15 was retired so that the Mercury astronaut, you know, so, they, so, for, so NASA could, could launch the Mercury program. So there's no, uh, of, of the 500 astronauts who have astronaut wings, I mean, I think that like less than a dozen um, have have their astronaut wings for a suborbital flight. So uh, it is um, it is in that sense, I think a, a, a you know a trickier proposition that people often give credit for. Another question from the audience related to what you called the democratization of space, at least in the Branson view on the industry. The question is, do you think that space ambitions should lie in the hands of a few eccentric male billionaires? Um. I think they do. I don't, I mean, uh, you know, I think that whoever um, is willing to kind of pony up the money uh, to be able to fund these ventures, I think that's, you know, I think that's kind of the nature. I mean, that, that's where it is. I, 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 um, I don't have a moral objection to the fact that they are, I mean, yes, they are male billionaires. They are the ones who are determining uh, and, and deciding kind of the course of, of the industry at this point. Um, but uh, sort of it is what it is. Um, uh, a, a question from me uh, combined with a question from the audience. Uh, we've heard about space tourism for a long time. Is 2021 the year that finally the industry takes off slash is there a valid date when the first commercial commercial flights for virgin galactic will start no so i mean is it the year that 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 tours will take off i think that the what what signals that an industry sort of taking taking root right because spacex is supposed to have this mission later this year to orbit um if that goes off that'll be a massive achievement and accomplishment. And, and SpaceX, because of their track record, um, I mean, SpaceX ha has launched hundreds of rockets before they tried to put a person on one. Now, again, they're going orbital. So uh, if you're sort of, you know, if there's an accident on the way to orbit, uh, okay, let me, let me put it this, let me rewind. The October 31st, 2014 accident um, the pilot who survived, you know, fell from, I think, 60,000 feet and survived. You, if you were 300,000 feet up when there was an accident, you wouldn't survive. And so, uh, so you, the, the, so there are those considerations. Um, there are those considerations kind of in the SpaceX versus Virgin Galactic space tourism model. I, 2021 is not the year that, that things will take off for Virgin Galactic. Namely, because uh, they still need to fly, they need they need they need to fly a number of flight tests, a number of test flights that prove that the technology is safe. And uh, they had a flight in December that they tried to to, to go to space, and they uh, had to abort because there was some uh, electrical uh, issue that had caused the rocket motor to abort. They were supposed to fly in February that on the eve of that flight, they realized that the, that, that the repairs that were supposed to have addressed the December abort hadn't been fixed yet. So they still need to get up. They need to do it. They need to do it two or three times. They need to, you know, at what point Richard Branson's going to have to get on uh, and, and he will fly. And then after that, they can start putting passengers on. But um, they need to prove that they can do it over and over and over again without any hiccups before I feel like you're going to have... Uh, um, Sort of customer confidence that this is, uh, you know, that this is this is a stable this is a stable platform for for you know taking a two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollar trip. You quote uh, Mark Stuckey in your book: um, um, "If you want to be safe, uh, go be a shoe salesman at Sears." Um, I understand that uh, statement coming from a test pilot, but how safe is it? How safe will it be to be a passenger on Virgin Galactic? I think that no matter how even even if they it, it, you can never you can never you'll never be able to remove all of the risk it will i don't know um i don't know how you sort of quantify that but even if they are successful um you know we can't sort of we can't we can't mistake 
past success for future reliability and predictability. And those questions of risk, um, those questions of risk are really interesting. And I've been thinking about it a lot from both a personal perspective, as well as from an institute, from kind of a business case perspective, like how does the company evaluate and assess risk? And how would I, as a potential customer, evaluate and assess risk? And I think that uh, what's interesting is that when I was with the company um, uh, on a regular basis, and I knew who sort of worked in what disciplines and who, who, who were the guys that were responsible for, for the rocket motor, et cetera, I was fully prepared to buckle up and, and, and go for a ride. And look, you know, we've all become much more risk averse in the past year. I mean, frankly, we see humans on the sidewalk and we, you know, jump to go to the other side of the road because we're, you know, human contact is now seen as kind of being risky. So um, in that, inside of that, in that context, uh, I have to kind of try and figure out how much of, how much of where I, how much of how I feel about uh, the potential, or how much I feel about my willingness to fly is a result of um, sort of COVID concerns or how much of it is a loss of faith in the program versus how much of it is just me kind of not wanting to take that risk. But I would be uh, less inclined to fly now than I would have been two years ago. Um, and uh, I just think that, you know, I think that anyone who's, who's thinking about it has to realize that um, even if they fly 20 times without an incident, uh, it will never be, uh, it will never be risk-free. Yeah, so um, considering all that, will you ever be flying with, with Virgin? And if so, will it be business or pleasure? <laughs> Me personally? Well, um, that's a good question. I mean, I think that uh, I kept, I, I, I said to Richard Branson on a couple of occasions, um, you know, in a casual, uh, hey, don't take this seriously if you don't want to take it seriously. But if you do want to take it seriously, go ahead and put my name on the list. Uh, but I would like to go. And um, I, uh, I've, no one has called me yet. So um, if, if, they give me, if they give me an invitation, then, then, I'll, then I'll figure out how to, uh, well, then, I'll, then I can make my decision as to whether I go or not. I don't know if, if, if I'm if I'm happy with that answer, avoiding, <laughs> <laughs> avoiding real answer, but, but fair well, enough. Well, okay, wait, well, hold on. What about you? You you cover the industry. Would you go um, with Virgin? Probably not, uh, because uh, we we we've talked about the the, the differences um, of uh, suborbital versus orbital, and uh, in that sense, uh, I think I would uh, side with uh, the the uh, participant from the audience saying, "Listen, um, if you want to feel uh, um, if you want to feel zero g, get on a plane." I had the opportunity to do that. I would do that. Uh, this very second, if you offered me a ticket, and I would probably uh, be interested um, in a, uh, uh, in, an, in, an, in a shortish orbital trip, not so much about um, half a year uh, on the ISS, but uh, that that would probably be be more appealing than uh, in in that sense. If I if I do my own equation, risk versus outcome, I think uh, the risk for a suborbital flight, at least for now, would be too high for me to, to, to do that for, for well, um, five minutes of fun and, uh, and a few selfies, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's interesting. I mean, I will say that, you know, on the question of uh, the kind of zero G flight, I mean, the view down onto Earth, I don't know where that, that uh, photograph, uh, you know, behind you is taken from, but the view, the view, the cockpit views, that they have taken uh, from their two space flights down on Earth uh, are stunning. I mean, they are you you are you are you are in space, no doubt about it. I mean, there it's 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 black outside. You're looking down on Earth. Um, it is it is stunning and sort of moving. Um, but your question about you know is it worth it for that short of a flight, uh, and especially with technology that's not been proven uh, to be safe or, or reliable at this point yet, is, is I think the the you know the two hundred fifty thousand dollar question. Um, so since this is not a two-man show again, uh, another question from the audience, uh, from a very dear colleague. Um, um, and uh, to some extent, you've, you've touched that already, but uh, you quote uh, Tom Wolf in your book. Um, did you take any inspiration from the right stuff? And do you see some similarities in the way you tell the story or differences? Yeah, I mean, yes. I think that, uh, as I was saying earlier, I mean, I... I always kind of thought that this was in some ways that, that the ethos 
um, among these pilots was similar to the ethos of the right stuff, that these guys were, um, were taking tremendous risks and they were the best of the best. And there was this, uh, I mean, they were, they were supremely qualified and confident and capable pilots. And the, um, the kind of tactile sensation in the cockpit was, was also reminiscent of, of what, what the, the guys of the, uh, you know, early Mercury program were going through. So, so in terms of similarities there, um, did I take, you know, I read the book twice over the course of the, you know, seven years that I was working on this total or six years that I was working on it. Uh, I'm sure that some of it um, uh, sort of bled into my thinking about structure and things like that. But, you know, Tom Wolf is one of those writers that uh, any attempt to kind of um, emulate him would be so immediately recognizable that uh, I feel like you, you, in some ways you read it, you, you, um, you read it for awe and not for sort of not to take notes necessarily. Um, and uh, so I think that, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it sort of cast a huge shadow. Um, I wish there, you know, when he, when he died a few years ago, I you know, was kind of kicking myself because I really wish that I could have gotten the book into his hands and would have loved to kind of hear what, what, what he thought about it. Um, but, uh, but, but I do think that what is, you know, he wrote all of that in retrospect and and wh where i think that test gods is is a little different is that when you have um sort of proximity and immediate access to those guys you're able i, I feel like i was able to sort of get, capture uh levels or, or sort of degrees of personal life that even tom wolf wasn't able to capture from the mercury astronauts uh for for you know the the monumental achievement that in this kind of singular achievement that is the right stuff uh, before uh, asking Nick uh, um, the next question, and I have a lot of them, um, no sweat, but uh, I would love to encourage you and the audience uh, to feed us some more questions. Um, so uh, please, please take the opportunity to, to do that. Uh, Nick, um, the, the subtitle of your book mentions the new space race, and uh, obviously it's genius from a PR perspective. Everybody knows the first space race between the US and the Soviets, so everybody will go for the second space race. But do you indeed perceive that what we have here, that this is a race again? No, it's, 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 it's well, first of all, if it is a race, SpaceX has already won, right? Um, and because the companies are all doing things, uh, I mean, it is a competition. I think there is a competition for, for market share between Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin. They are offering, um, they are uh, uh, proposing to offer um, a similar flight profile uh, in, in, in quite different ways because uh, Blue Origin will, will, will have a vertical, traditional vertical takeoff and landing, whereas Space, I mean, whereas Virgin Galactic will have its, its um, air launch system so that's the only i think element of the the competition the race um and the players in the company i mean the ceo at the time uh a virgin galactic guy named george whitesides would constantly sort of play down the 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 race narrative um uh, but mike moses the president you know he he, he would kind of embrace it and say like, yeah, you know, they're going to, you know, with respect to blue origin, I mean, they're going to beat us. And that was always, they, they, it was always a kind of a, they talked about blue origin as a, as a, as a close competitor. Um, so, so in that sense, there is, uh, there is a, there is a, a, a competition between those two companies to kind of get to market first. Um, another question from the audience. Uh, any idea uh, what the Chinese have in store? Seems like uh, um, they do come pretty pretty suddenly uh, uh, in, into the field, moon, Mars, and uh, tons of new business models? I don't, unfortunately. But if, um, I mean, I would be interested in embedding with a Chinese rocket company. I think that would be, <laughs> that would be fun. But no, I, I don't, unfortunately. And another question, uh, what about some of the even newer space startups, including in Germany? Uh, you know, I think that, I think that there are, um, there are so many of them right now popping up because of the success of, uh, you know, Rocket Labs and, and SpaceX that I think that, uh, you know, you see graduates and alums of these companies going and starting their own companies and looking for sort of niche markets. And so, uh, 
I'm sure that there will be many, many, many more. And, um, you know, it's there, there's whether there's, whether there's kind of a space bubble right now or not. I mean, the, the question is at some point, at some point, all of these companies launching all of these satellites is going to make our internet speeds better and is going to make um, uh, our life, uh, it's going to sort of potentially improve the quality of life on earth, but is going to really muck up our views of, 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 uh, of space on a, on a, on a, you know, on a, on a quiet evening when you're out in the middle of the desert and you're hoping to kind of look up and just see the stars. I mean, I do, it, it is cool to see sort of Starlink constellations, SpaceX Starlink constellations going across the sky. Um, and it does remind you sort of where we are when you see these satellites um, orbiting. But, uh, you know, the question of space debris is, is, a, is, a, is a real question. Um, let, let's talk business for a second. Um, you, you mentioned uh, the, the, the specs. You mentioned the, the, the billions of dollars uh, flowing uh, into the industry right now. Is there too much money um, in the industry? I, I mean, I understand that that uh, new space, whatever it is, is a very costly endeavor. But um, at the same time, uh, money is not, not always... Uh, a good thing for for reasonable thought, uh, for for ethics, for whatever. So, is is there too much money right now? I mean, I think the I, I think the the. I mean, I'm not I I'm not the I don't feel like I'm sort of in a position to determine whether there is too much money or not too much money. I mean, I think there is. Look, the problem is when companies are you know the the challenge with the SPACs is that. Uh, you know, when you're, you're, when you're buying into a rocket company without a proven technology and you're reliant purely on, uh, you know, what are essentially back of the envelope estimates that have been printed on, uh, you know, that have been kind of formatted and, and, and sent to the, S to the you know, Securities and Exchange Commission and, and various kind of authorities, financial authorities in the U.S., it gives them uh, a sense of authority that just doesn't, uh, it, it, you can't, you, none of these companies kn know where they're going to be in a year. And if they're telling you that they're going to, uh, that they've launched zero rockets this year, but they're going to launch 20 next year, um, they're either crazy or they're hucksters. And so I do think that there is, uh, there is that element right now of companies uh, over promising because of the, the sort of influx of capital um, but I don't know, I have no way of kind of assessing their, their engineering, um, uh, their design plan, their, their plans, their engineering plans to be able to know kind of how they match up with the economic realities. With all that money, with all these uh, big plans, uh, what will be the, the state of things in space in one, three, one, two, three decades? Uh, what about Moon? Will, will Elon be living on Mars eventually? Will will be filing proposals for for research trips uh, uh, to to Mars for for for, for interviews? So what what? what with 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 all these these great visionaries, with all the the tools that developing that they're developing, where will we end up? Um, let's say in a in a foreseeable future. Yeah, well, uh, let me just sort of take one piece of that question, which is the um, you know the colonizing of Mars. I mean, I think this actually gets back a little bit to the question you asked earlier about is it worth it for the suborbital and in, in the sub, for the suborbital mission? And I was talking about the kind of the the exploration for the sake of exploration and and um you know when i think about going to mars or think about colonizing mars uh and i think about the photograph you know the photographs that have been taken recently from the from the rover um uh i don't really want like who wants to live there <laughs> i mean um I like, I like plants in my office, right? I mean, I like, I like a little bit of green space in my world, in my life. So, so um, but that's not to say that the expedition itself of getting there and coming back doesn't, doesn't sort of uh, fill me with some excitement. And so I think that, um, I don't know, I just, I, I, I haven't, I don't know the person or I don't know the person who seriously thinks that he wants to go live on Mars um, to be able to have that conversation with and understand sort of what would be the rationale for wanting to do that. But I do feel like I know the people, myself included, who would uh, be open to maybe taking that trip. 
or, or a trip into, you know, a trip around, like, let me go around the moon. Uh, I mean, that sounds spellbindingly cool. Um, but, uh, yeah, but I don't have any sense of like to sort of, you know, to cut ties with this world and go live on a, on a space colony doesn't, doesn't do much for me. Mm -hmm. Another question from the audience. When will we have a permanently manned moon station? Oh, yeah, these are really good questions. Um, unfortunately, you've definitely got the wrong guy. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know. Um, I'm sorry. I, I, I couldn't even, couldn't even uh, offer a guess. So, well, then let's make it even more complicated. Um, <laughs> we've talked about Moon, we've talked about Mars. Now let's think even bigger. Another question from the audience. Are you intrigued by the search for extraterrestrial intelligence? Is that something you want to get, you want to get into? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, so that kind of stuff, because for me that, I don't know what, I don't know what it about it. I mean, that seems like there is a, uh, there's a, there's a, uh, there's an expeditionary element of it. I mean, the, the notion of kind of going farther than anyone has ever gone. And I realize that that's what, that's what, you know, Mars, that's what the Mars, uh, a Mars expedition would be. Right. I, I, I accept that. Um, but, uh, so would I be interested in, you know, when I, would I kind of love to write about some, you know, deep space, ex uh, um, uh, uh, uh journey to go try and find you know artificial or extra extraterritorial intelligence sure that's 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 cool but um yeah uh i mean if they if there's a if there's a trip of that nature i would certainly love to write about it i'm sure you could also uh um well get acquainted with the subject here on earth because uh obviously there are projects searching for uh, extraterrestrial intelligence um uh, <laughs> based on this planet so is is, is that of interest to you What's that? Say again. Repeat the question. Um, would would uh, SETI projects here on Earth, not getting on a spaceship and flying yeah. out eventually, would that be uh, interesting to you? Yeah, totally. I mean, I think yeah, that's. But but for, but I think that that was part of you know. So interestingly, to bring it back to 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 the characters in the book, I mean, one of the interesting elements is that I that night that I was with um, Stucky after he went to space, and I asked him. Um, if the experience had changed him as much as he, 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 he had this on, on like his third or fourth NASA interview. Um, one of the, the, either the doctors or the psychologist had, had asked him a bunch of questions and then said at the end, as he was sort of parting with him, uh, I hope it's everything you make it out to be. If, if, you know, if you eventually ever get to space, I hope it's everything that, that, that you hope it'll be or something like that. And so I asked him that night, I said, so was it, you know, was it everything you hoped it would be? And, and he kind of, there was a little bit of a shrug. He was like, you know, yeah, it was cool. But I think the most important, I mean, I know for a fact that the most important element aspect of that day was coming down and sort of being, you know, having re having reestablished his relationship with his kids and being able to sort of come down and have that, um, uh, and have his, his son there and, and be able to sort of share that moment with his son after having kind of patched up their relationship. And, and, and you'll, you know, for very, uh, you know, for, 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 I, I did not end the book with a space trip for good reason, which is that it is this personal journey and the personal journey ends, um, the book ends with, with Stucky watching his son, Stucky having injured himself in a paragliding accident and watching his son, um, launch off the side of this mountain in a paraglider and because for me that captures that was the takeaway kind of of the project which is that um our job as fathers uh is to is to is to you know we, the greatest fulfillment the greatest sort of satisfaction that we feel is watching um our children sort of do things that they didn't think they could do. And so for him to watch his son sort of run and jump off this hill, I mean, that for him was the great satisfaction, was, was, like, was like a kind of crowning achievement of, 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 of satisfaction. So um, that just to bring it back to kind of terrestrial considerations, but um, yeah. If we've talked about a lot, uh, we, we've talked a lot about uh, fathers and sons tonight. Um, another question from the audience, I think a very good one. 
what role do women play in the story of Virgin Galactic and in your story? Yeah, um, well, I mean, I have an incredible wife and an incredible mother who, uh, um, yes, are, are every bit, if not more important to me than the men in my life. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, the, so, so at, a, at a personal level, yeah, I mean, at a personal level, that's, 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 I mean, there's, there's, there's no doubt. I mean, there's, um, that they have made me sort of who I am as much as my father has made me who I am. Um, at Virgin Galactic, look, the en engineering is a male dominated field and, um, and astronauts are, are predominantly male. And at one point, I remember having this conversation with, with uh, Christine Choi, the, the former communications uh, head at Virgin Galactic, who got me in the door. And she said, you know, we need, to, uh, we need to find you some more women to interview. And I said, uh, I think that might be an HR issue <laughs> more than it is a journalistic issue. Because I said, you look around the, you know, you look around the hangar and, you know, yes, there are, there are women around, but like it is, it, it's, a, it's a male dominated world. Um, that said, uh, in the February, in the second Virgin Galactic second space flight, um, so they've right now, full, they've had five, they sent five employees into space. Four of them were test pilots and one of them was an engineer. And uh, this woman, Beth Moses, who uh, incidentally is also the spouse of the president, um, <laughs> she is a former NASA engineer. And uh, she was the one who flew on the second space flight in the back. And, and, and you know, for her, and for them, it was sort of a, um, uh, that was like a proving the test case, if you will, that they could put a passenger in the back. Now, the fact that the ship on descent um, almost came apart because of uh, the structural integrity of the ship was compromised would have been a, uh, would, have, would have not proven the test case and could have been a, it could have been a very bad day very quickly. Um, but uh, yeah, but so Beth, I mean, Beth's role in in both uh, you know sort of helping design the interior of the ship and then being on that on that very sort of pivotal flight is uh, you know is a central part of, of of Virgin Galactic's narrative at this point. Um, talking about the, the tough guys for for one last time probably uh, another question from the audience uh, Chuck Yeager uh, who, who you mentioned already he was critical of the Mercury program considering it no real piloting is Virgin Galactic. Uh, bringing space flight back to the real pilots? Um, yes, Pri privately among, uh, over beers, certainly. I mean, they, that's, that's, what they, that's what distinguishes them, right? That's what they, and that's what, that is what they uh, sort of pride themselves on, which is that this is a, you know, this is not as, as a, you know, this is not just kind of a, a one, two, three lift off and come back down um, experience and and you know there is the the, the spam in a can um, derogatory comment that Chuck Yeager made about the Mercury pilots, uh, which may actually have only been in the film and not in the in the book. Um, but that sentiment is there that that these guys that the that the pilots at Virgin Galactic are the ones that are actually flying the rockets and not just sort of riding on the rockets. So uh, there is that uh, you can detect that sort of uh, uh, elitism and superiority, if you will, uh, in the conversations, you know, with, with the pilots and, and with, you know, with others in the company as well. Another question from the audience uh, to change the subject a bit. Could using your actual knowledge be a base for you to write space science fiction stuff? Mm, that's a good question. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's a good question. I mean, it's, it, it's interesting. Um, but I don't know. I think the challenge is that, uh, well, look, I think that with any amount of research in the same way that you, we research nonfiction projects to make sure that we uh, know what we're talking about and don't end up looking like fools if we're kind of generalist and then we're branching into a very really highly technical field like this. Um, something like that would be interesting to do in, in, in the kind of, you know, in, in the, the scientific space fiction, uh, science, science fiction sort of speculative fiction world. Um, but, uh, but I certainly don't have the, the, the technical or scientific chops to, to take that on, uh, like tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, and as a last question, uh, 
with a little suggestion from the audience, my last question would be, after this uh, big adventure, what's next for you? And there are indeed some, some ideas from the audience, for example, uh, a book following Elon, maybe uh, um, in relation with the Giga Factory near Berlin, or this, uh, the, 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 the participant says, maybe a two-step with uh, Tim Cook's chip facility in Munich, how California takes Germany into the 21st century. So what, what, what's next for you? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I would love to write a book about it. I mean, if Elon would give me this level of access, uh, I would love to write that book, uh, whether it's about the, you know, whether it's about the, the, the trip with the, um, uh, around the moon that they're planning, or whether it's their space tourism flight at the end of this year. Uh, but, but that offer has not come through yet. And so uh, it's a good question. You know, we, we moved um, to London uh, about a year and a half ago, right at the time that I was actually kind of sitting down to write the book. And my thought was always when I finished the book and I would sort of look around and figure out uh, whether I want to get back into doing magazine journalism or what I wanted to do. The world has, has, has obviously changed so much that um, not only kind of am I in a place where I, uh, where it's a whole new beat and a whole new kind of setup, but it's also, it's a, it's a world that the kind of journalism that I've been accustomed to doing for the past 10 years, the New Yorker, one can't really do right now. I can't, you know, Virgin Galactic is still, they're still doing tests and they're still, you know, they're still operating as a company, but, you know, there are no reporters that are around or, you know, there's no one, no non-essential individuals, people are left around, are around the company. So um, it's finding, it's finding opportunities and figuring out what sort of stories will hold my interest and, and knowing, uh, tentatively knowing that uh, if a story really holds my interest, I could be uh, doing it for the next seven years and making sure that it's something I really am passionate about. Christoph, I take it you're handing it back to me. Uh, that was a fantastic discussion. Um, Nick, I'm, I'm, I'm still eager to know what the uh, next uh, printed words uh, from your pen will be, uh, even if it's not a book, but um, I'm uh, certainly looking forward to getting uh, the book itself. Um, I just want to thank everyone for joining us. To Nick, I want to say, um, the, uh, the invitation is still open. We hope we'll see you in Berlin sometime soon, perhaps with a uh, printed book in hand. Uh, it's a completely, completely fascinating uh, story and uh, congratulations on, on finding a, something really terrific to write about. Uh, as, uh, before we close, I just want to uh, let the audience know um, that our next uh, event at the uh, uh, American Academy will be the Axel Springer lecture uh, for this term. It's entitled Age of Emergency, Colonial Violence at the End of the British Empire. And it will be uh, delivered by Eric Lindstrom, who is one of our fellows at the Academy uh, this semester. And so I very much hope you can uh, join us. And um, it will, of course, bring us back to Earth. But um, we'll stay in touch with Nick in case we, uh, we need to um, uh, touch the stars again. So uh, thank you, uh, Christoph, for the great job moderating and and um, and questioning uh, Nick. And um, uh, thanks again for joining us. <laughs>